Hey guys, remember way back when I proposed doing a beginner's series on restoring vintage black and white TVs, I had uh, started with a magnetically deflected set and I then picked up a really nice looking electrostatically deflected big light admiral set and I proposed doing a separate series on electrostatic TVs and you may be wondering well, whatever became of that oh oh I spent many hours I recorded a lot of footage trying to restore what should be a very basic TV and I gave up in frustration someday that footage may see the light of day but that day is not today <laughs> um, I'll give you a, a short version something bad happened to that set the uh, the main filter cap was dead shorted and the 5Y3 rectifier was toast. I think it may have damaged the primary, or sorry, damaged the power transformer. I got all kinds of weird issues. I would think it was working and then it would, I would, more issues would develop. I was swapping out parts from other sets, the tuner, high voltage coil. I had problems in all the circuits. So I uh, took a step back knowing that I had a number of junker sets. I'd done some trading years ago and some... Uh, well, I ended up with a number of chassis with busted up cabinets, and this is one of those chassis, which is actually in really, really nice condition. One of the cleanest I've ever seen. So I'm going to put this in it. It's also a later production chassis when they rotated the power transformer 45 degrees to reduce magnetic pickup on the CRT. Now, it's already been recapped, partially. Not that well, a long time ago. So this is where we're at. Now, occasionally, this the image... Oh, sorry, let me turn the lights down. i got some very bright lights going on. So I have, as usual, my green oscilloscope 7VP1 CRT in here. I saved the... Well, I also, I should say, when I did this trading, they also, the chassis came without picture tubes. So we will be using the picture tube and the cabinet. So it's, we're going to be combining stuff from a couple sets to make one really nice set. So I have my green scope CRT in here. Occasionally this will give me a nice full raster. Right now it's not behaving itself. That's one issue we need to track down. But it actually does play well. I'll try to get this full screen again so you can see that. I don't know what does it. I know some of the tubes like this six, this is a vertical deflection tube. It's a little wonky. Oh, there we go. So yeah, we have a couple wonky tubes or wonky socket connections, but generally speaking, the brightness up here, oops. It's generally speaking, it's working pretty darn well. We have some interference because I don't have the shield installed on the CRT and I don't have the high voltage box fully seated. Uh, we also have a really bad linearity, uh, both horizontally and vertically, and that's the first thing we're going to tackle. Why is the linearity so crummy? Well, I think part of it is because of these guys. They used ceramic capacitors for coupling the signal from the deflection circuits to this picture tube in particular they use Z5U dielectric ceramic caps. It's a really lousy dielectric. These really cheap dielectric types have a couple really bad properties. One, they drift like crazy with temperature. Two, the capacitance changes significantly with the applied voltage. And we're applying hundreds of volts across these so the waveforms get really distorted. So with the edges we're feeding in sawtooths, which should be really super clean sawtooths, both horizontally and vertically. They get distorted, so it results in nonlinearity. If you really want to use ceramic and you really want to use a cheap dielectric, one way around that is if you used about 10 times the value it's supposed to be. So these should be 4,700 for the vertical. If you use 47,000. But a 47,000 picofarad, 6,000 volt cap would be huge and very expensive. So what's, why even bother? Instead, 
what I did was I went and installed plastic film. Still in the process. I'm using these Vima caps. This is the only 6,000 volt plastic caps that are readily available at Mauser and DigiKey these days. If you want, you can get axial caps. A little bit harder to find. Only a reliable source I know of of those is Just Radios in Canada. Expect to pay about eight bucks a pop for them, whereas these are less than two bucks a pop. The only downside to these is they're square boxes, so you need to attach extension leads. But other than that, they work just fine. I have the two vertical deflection, two horizontal deflection in place. There's one buried down in there that is the filter cap on the high voltage supplies that comes right out of this box. Now here's a look at the work I've done on the rest of it. We have a crazy mix of different types of uh, capacitors that they used. We've got everything from some Sprague Atom Electrolytics We've got some mica caps, we have some orange drop polypropylene, we have some polyester film. We have, uh, some of these I think are oil, are paper with oil impregnated. This one's actually an old Admiral part number, but it looks like it might be a plastic film cap. I, I don't know. It looks like they used whatever they could scrounge out of their junk box. That's, that's plastic film, but that's super old school, like from the 60s. And the uh, main filter can on top, the electrolytic, is actually, it, it's, uh, it's a replacement, but it's a relatively new replacement, so I think it might have a bit of life left in it, so at least for now I'm going to leave it in there. <sighs> so, we have a few things to work out right away. One is I want to deal with the linearity. There's also this later edition, it actually has a vertical linearity control down here, they added an extra pot. It doesn't seem to do anything. And the vertical linearity is especially bad. I already tested it with these do caps in place and it got better. It's still not perfect. This control doesn't seem to be doing anything. I'll, I'll show you that in a moment. So we want to investigate that. And then why does the width and the, the height occasionally shrink and I got to tap tubes? We might have bad tube connections. We might have bad tubes. Uh, and then we'll go from there. I do intend to basically replace all these caps. There are some strange looking <laughs> caps in here. This guy, it's a type that's a metal tube that you, that you ground so that actually uh, you could shield the entire cap. It's like really, it's like a feed through cap. Here's a better look at it, this guy. And this guy's only rated for 100 volts. Or sorry, for. Here's a better look at it. Uh, and this guy's only rated for 100 volts. I don't know if that's good enough. Probably this is the audio circuitry down here. Uh, I just want to go through. So <laughs> I, I don't know the age in some of these caps. Some of these electrolytics, like this one on the video amp, looks really ancient. It's actually an electrolytic and that metal can back in there. So is that white cap up there, uh, the ratio detector. It's a really ancient axial electrolytics. Let's, let's get all that stuff out of there. Double check all the resistors while we're going to. Alright, so here it is with a cross hatch. It's hard to see because we, we had a few issues going on here. One, the reception, the contrast isn't as good as it can be. <laughs> Cuts out occasionally. I gotta clean all these tube sockets. I've, 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 as I work on this, I've gotten to, to learn which tubes to tap when things go out. There's one of these 6AU6s is also flaky. Horizontally, it's not too bad. These squares are fairly uniform going across, but you can see vertically, it's really bad. That could be as simple as swapping out the 6SL7. Well, here's that linearity adjustment. One from one extreme to the other. It has some, some effect, but nowhere near as much as it should. So we got to figure out what's going on with that. It's easier to see with the circle pattern. Well, the first thing I decided to go after was this one crummy old cap that had an Admiral part number on it, which makes me suspect it is an original cap. 
it's 0 .004, which is kind of an odd value, so maybe that's why they left it in there. I replaced it with uh, 0 .0039, which is pretty darn close, and hey, that seems to have fixed the problem. Not only do I have good linearity, but the linearity control now works really well, actually. <laughs> some programming. Again, I don't have all the shields in place, so we're definitely getting some interference. But overall, it's looking pretty good. So I will continue on going through everything, and uh, Hopefully things will gradually continue to improve, but even as is, this is working quite well for an electrostatic set. Well, I was just making some final adjustments and starting to wrap this project up when the vertical linearity went egg-shaped on me again and the control doesn't do anything. So I've been tinkering around the control. I replaced a couple of the old carbon comp resistors that are we're going to it that it drifted off a little bit, but at a zero effect. So I disconnected uh, two of the wires going to the pots. There's just one outer leg connected now. In other words, I isolated the uh, center wiper and the opposite lug. And let's check the resistance across the pot. It's supposed to be a 5 mag pot. It's measuring 40 ohms. So, I think what has happened is, well, something's going to awry inside the control. Curious thing though, if I put the leads from one of the outer legs to the center wiper, I get 1.1 mag, and it does vary with the control, but rather than going all the way, it should be going between 0 and 5 mag, it'll get up to about 1.1 mag, and then it starts going the other way. And goes down to almost zero. So there's something very wrong in there. So I'm going to disconnect everything from the pot and, and take it out entirely so we can check it out. There could be tin whiskers inside. Maybe a little fleck of solder where something got inside there. I don't know. Worst case scenario, the control was shot. I'll have to replace it. Hmm. Well, what do you know? Took it completely out of circuit and now it checks out okay. I can go up to almost 5 meg and all the way down to zero. I had a feeling it was going to be intermittent because, well, it was working, then it wasn't. Well, it wasn't, then it was, then it wasn't. Nothing that I saw fell out or anything. I like to keep this control in there because these are rather well made. Nice little neural knobs there. Or a neural uh, shaft. So, I'll blow a little compressed air in there. I already shot some deoxidant to it. Check for anything obvious. See these contact pads here? They come pretty close to the metal body. Not really enough that it would make contact, I wouldn't think. But yeah, I'll poke around with it and reinstall it. And <laughs> this is why when you think, yes, that's working, you have to let them run tap them a little bit, power cycle them. You gotta make sure that it's as stable as you can make it before you put it all back together or you're just gonna ask or you're just asking for trouble. Yep, I took care of it. Linearity control is working again. So <laughs> I'll resume with bench testing this power cycling while I do some cabinet detailing. There was one nagging issue remaining. You get the set looking great, good linearity, good sync, turn it off, turn it back on. The horizontal would always collapse to a strip about one inch wide. I'd have to twiddle with the sync, and then it would go back to full width. Turn the set back off, turn it on, same problem kept collapsing. Now there is very, very, very little to the horizontal oscillator output stage. It's a triode and two transformers, couple caps, few resistors, that's it. 
Remarkably clever design. Motorola also used it. Uh, there's a real, there's a great write-up in detail about how this works. I'll give you a real short, simple version. It's a sine wave oscillator that runs on a much lower frequency than what is actually needed. It needs to be almost 16 kilohertz. This runs at one or two kilohertz. It makes a sine wave, which, of course, gives you that sine wave shape. If you look close at a sine wave and zoom in on it, imagine there's the the axis and it's crossing and we're getting that loop. The part where it starts going up before it loops over is actually quite linear. So what they do is they start the oscillator and we get that nice linear section and they use that to drive it and before it starts to curve over they kill the oscillation and start the cycle over again. So instead of getting the complete sine wave, it starts, stops, starts, stops, starts, stops, which produces a sawtooth. And essentially a sort of a step-up transformer self-resonance produces an output that's several hundred volts in amplitude, symmetrical. So you get the push-pull output that drives the two deflection plates with almost uh, very few components. Couldn't use the same trick for the vertical because it runs at a much lower frequency and it's very hard to make a very low frequency. Imagine it would have to be just a few hertz or fractions of hertz to do the same thing, and that that would be very hard to make a stable oscillator at that low frequency. Anyways, here are the two caps, 2000 picofarad mega caps. I always assume if it's something's not working right, it's got to be the caps, right? And these did test kind of weird, a little bit off in value, but tacking and replacements did absolutely nothing. Uh, the last thing I wanted to check was the transformers because the only way I can replace those is to scavenge them from another set. Tried swapping out the tube, check the pot, it's all seemed to be fine. The only thing left were two fixed 39K resistors that are in parallel with the transformer windings, which will dampen the Q of those coils. Doesn't seem like a critical part, doesn't seem all that uh, likely to be causing this problem, but you know what? Yes, they did. I've found quite a few really bad resistors in this set. Let's check a few of them here. So here's one of the 39Ks. For some reason, one of them is a lot bigger than the other. I don't think either one of them really particularly needs to be high wattage. Since the coil is much lower resistance, it's going to be dominating the current flow. So here's the bigger 39k. 58 off, off certainly more than the 10% it's supposed to be. Check out the other one, the little guy. Not only is it high, it's pretty unstable. When I was measuring it last night, I was getting more like 90k. I'm putting my finger on it now just to warm it up a little. And even with that, it just it dropped. So, yeah, replacing those two got it to be more stable. Let's check a few others. There's a 4.7K. It's an important part of the power supply. Drops voltage before it goes off to one of the circuits. Should be 4.7K. It's 7.4K. <laughs> so, replace that guy. There's a, some of these are really crummy looking, too. Like, I think that... I can't remember that's supposed to be 100 ohm or 1K or 10K because it's so discolored. Let's see what it actually measures. So that's supposed to be a 10K resistor. That looks like 100 ohms to me. That the color stripe is just so obliterated. So I went through and I checked a bunch of resistors and replaced some bad ones. And so it's working quite well now. So I'm going to turn my attention to, to putting this thing back together. Alrighty, set's playing well. I'll do the final tune-up once back in the cabinet. The cabinet is made of Bakelite with the plastic insert for the faceplate uh, screen bezel and uh, this little channel insert here is also a different type of plastic and they tend to warp but this one's in pretty darn good shape. They snap in. 
I wouldn't dream of trying to get this out, or I don't suggest you do, because you have a very good chance of breaking it. Um, now, as far as polishing it, well, Novus Number no. 2 is, as usual, is my go-to. Top surface, piece of cake. Sides, a little annoying, because there are these raised ridges, but this is the real nightmare. <laughs> this is the speaker grill. I have no tips for you other than patience. Um, Q-tips, get in there, clean it. Uh, toothpicks to scrape out the excess. Uh, so I, I have uh, spared you the boredom of seeing most of that. The sides are basically done, the top's basically done. I've done a couple passes on this. I do need to clean out the crud from this. And uh, there is some junk on the inside of this, so I'm going to get at it. This is held in place by some press-on uh, spring steel, tenorman fasteners, T-nuts, whatever they're called. Uh, again, I don't suggest you try to get those off because you have a good chance of breaking off the posts. So I'll just clean it in place as best I can. Uh, hopefully that crud will come off fairly readily. And then unfortunately there's a scratch down the front of this. Um, but honestly, as far as these go, this is in remarkably good condition. I mean, a lot of these things are 70 years old or so, 75 almost, um, or over 75. Wet sanding uh, on that, this a little stain, brown marker to get in there to darken that scratch, take care of it. I'll do the best I can. Here we are after <laughs> about a hundred Q-tips and toothpicks. I got the grill cleaned off quite well, and the set is playing very well. So, uh, it's going to be a wrap for this project. Uh, to the 7JP4 that came with this still has a decent amount of life left. Uh, generally, these are one of the easier seven inch sets to restore and one of the better performing um but yes like i said that the chassis it came with and maybe someday we'll get back to looking at it uh but for now this project is a wrap i hope you enjoyed it mm -hmm.